Local productions on QTV are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to our innovative edition of Junior Don's The Spark. This is a four-part series about life on the Mississippi River as I experienced it. I hope you'll enjoy following me on my adventure. Hello everyone, this is Junior Doan and welcome to Junior Doan's The Spark. I'm really excited that you're with us today because this is part of the American experience that I'm having. I am speaking to you now from the lounge of the America, which is part of the American Cruise Line. And we are on a voyage up the Mississippi from New Orleans to St. Louis. And I'm really happy today to sit with Harry Moon because he's a noted wine lecturer. And we have just come from a wonderful lecture that he has given. And so I'd like to know a little bit about his background. And then he's going to teach us how to pair wine and cheese. And he tells me I'm the guinea pig, so we'll see. What is your background? How did you get into this line of work, Harry? So, kind of by accident. I was originally going to be a ballet dancer. Um, and then that, of course, didn't pan out. <laughs> so I decided to go to school. And just so happened that near to where I lived, there was a fully functioning winery that was part of the Seattle Colleges, because I live in Seattle. Um, it's a fully functioning winery, and you can get a degree in either winemaking, marketing, and sales or food and wine care. Um, I attended the school for a number of years, I volunteered there, I later worked there. Now I work in the wine industry in Seattle, as well as doing this, traveling in America, talking to people about wine. Which did you specialize in the three uh, kind of I kind of dabbled. Actually, I, I, I never kind of found my one focus. I, I spent time with the winemaking students and did some wine pairing and some marketing sales. So I tried to cover all my bases. Do you have to explain wine differently to different audiences? I, in a way, I, I, I think it's, it's good to be inclusive for everyone. I mean, you have to gauge how much people know and how much they want to know. Um, sometimes you can, people will, will get lost in all the verbiage. There's a lot of you know, sayings and acronyms. So it's kind of just making it approachable for people. Because wine can be kind of scary. For, for most folks. What I learned from your lecture, I learned two things that I thought I hadn't known before. One is the palate, the sensation, taste buds differ in range and therefore perception, taste mm -hmm. perception. And the other thing is that, <laughs> and that's got another name, but how to gargle and inhale. How to, how to gargle the wine. <laughs> uh, because 80% because is smell, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. but then you have the taste and Oh, so that, that's really uh, uh, something. To just mention a little something about taste buds. Right. Because I think that's important to know. Because some people, some, including myself when I started, feel a little insecure. Why is everyone raving about this and I'm not? <laughs> yeah, and yeah, wine has become kind of this scary thing. It has to do with status. If you like what's popular, if you don't, you're not cool. Um, really what we're doing when we're tasting wine is we're smelling. 80% is smell, 20% is taste. We can only taste five things, uh, sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami. And all those, all those things that we think we're tasting, the raspberries, the strawberries, the dirt, uh, we're really smelling. Um, and the gargling that you were talking about is retro nasal tasting. We call it. There's a you've got something called the olfactory bulb behind your nose. It's tied to your memory cortex. Um, and when you're gargling, when you're inhaling, you have the wine in your mouth. You swish it around, and then you inhale as it's in your mouth. You're getting that wine closer to that uh, bulb and closer to your memory cortex. But you didn't inhale through your mouth. Right? Exactly. Yeah. So you're gonna. <laughs> Might as well imbibe while we're at it. <laughs> it's very early in the morning, everybody. <laughs> we started at 9 o'clock this morning, so that's fine. You want to sniff? Okay. 
swirl? Yeah. Well, let's start right there. I smell fruity. So what, are we for? what kind of fruity? It's, it's, I want to say citrus, but it isn't. Yeah, it's totally citrus. It's a uh, grapefruit. It's grapefruit? It's grapefruit citrus. How interesting. Well, it, I've it never is, known it, to do that. Hopefully it is. <laughs> It might be another kind of citrus based on okay, your... Okay, we're swirling it around because that experience. does what? You're basically having the wine come into contact with more air. You're going to get more aromas, it's different true, aromas. Is red and white wine? Yep. Yeah. Okay, and I know not to touch the bowl. Exactly. Because... It'll it'll warm up your wine. And we don't um, want to do that. And also get fingerprints on your bowl, which, you know, aesthetically, some people... I'm, I'm into aesthetics. So how how... How long would you do this? Oh, a few seconds. As long as you like, really. I mean, you can keep swirling with the wine warm up a little bit. This wine's a little cold. Um, I have it on ice. So what, what should you chill it at? What degree? So I like my whites 45 to 50. Um, and then because my, it doesn't overwhelm the taste yeah, or the so aroma? Exactly. If it's cooled down too much, you're not going to be able to smell or taste anything. It's gonna, if the wine's too cold, you're going to have your stunted aromas. If it's too warm, it's just, it's, it's not going to be nice either. It's going to be kind of uh, sticky and, and, and foreign. It's, it's, it's not going to be enjoyable. Okay, so we swirled, and now what are we doing? Now you're going to smell again? Does it smell different at all? Or does it yes, smell more it, intense? Uh, it, um, I would say less citrusy, but fuller. Okay. And that, longer? Yes. Mm -hmm. Is that a, can you describe that as a... <laughs> I think you describe it. Yeah, you describe it. It's, it's just you're getting more more intensity of your aroma. It's, it's longer, it's fuller. I mean, when we talk about intensity of aroma, you basically have the glass where you can smell the aromas, how far away it is. Oh, from your nose. it actually changed when I copied you right? this now. It, 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 as you swirl, now it's more intense, farther it away. It is, yes. Yeah. So that's basically what you're doing when you're swirling. Okay, and then uh, what is the technique for tasting? Well, my technique. Yes, what is your technique there? <laughs> so you're going to put it in your mouth, you're going to swirl it around, you're going to coat your entire mouth with it, and then you are, that's the first step. And then the second step is the retronasal part, which we can demonstrate together. So we're just taking a little sip mm -hmm. or a big sip? A medium sip. You can swallow. You have to keep it in the pressure. I actually did feel it up here, but I can't tell if that's the cold or, or the that's alcohol. <laughs> or that's yeah. so when you you smell it from this old fat, what does that feel like? Or what does it give you that you, if you hadn't done that, you wouldn't have? You're, you're basically just getting deeper into the aromas. You're just it's more sensitive. You're getting more sensitive. You're getting some air in there. Uh, you're just building on the intensity of, of the aromas that are already in the wine. Now, once you've had a sip, would you repeat that? Or? If you're tasting, yeah. If you're if you're doing a tasting, a seated tasting, if you're in a in a wine uh, tasting room. You could do it if you're, if you're just tasting. If you're drinking it, though, you know, you know, then just chug it. So when they do wine tastings, and, you know, they're sipping water, right, to clear their palate, mm -hmm. does, does your perception change? In other words, is there a, a limit to the number of wines a professional taster can do before they lose I think the freshness? So, yeah. And what, I, would you, what range would you think that is? Very different for everybody. It's even different day by day. I mean, your palate is going to change from one day to the next. You're going to taste differently. Um, common thought is we actually taste the best between 11 and 2. 11 a.m. And, and, and 2 p.m. That's when you you taste the best, you're more primed to taste. Um, but it's going to be different for everybody. Um, at big tastings or at competitions or someone, you know, when they have the judges come on one, I've talked, spoken to a couple of them and they've said, yeah, it's just by the end of the day, your palate is, is wrecked. Um, yes. And you just want a beer at that point. But how many would they taste if they're doing it all day? So some, some of those people I've seen, I mean, 50, 100 50? 100 
Yeah, I've. I mean, I've. I've been, <coughs> been in classes before where I've tasted yes. through. I mean, twenty-five wines or thirty wines, and at the end of the day, I'm your palate's exhausted because you have to analyze every wine. If you had tasted the first five mm-hmm. and then tasted it again at the, at the end, would you have? A similar reaction to the first five, or I would hope. <laughs> I would hope I would, but I think, for me at least, I've, I've done that before, and it's been my, yes. yeah, my my experience. So, if you have a wine, is it you want your wine tasted earlier in the sequence of the professional, or midway, or towards the end? Of uh, that 11 to 2, or? No, no, no. Um, no, no, no. I meant in the number of wines, the taste oh, of the in the tasting. number of wines. Yeah, I'm happier uh, tasting, you know, less of time. I'd like to do like a spurt of 15, take a break, have a beer, eat some crackers, and then taste more. I mean, to sit down and taste an intense number of wines, I think you're doing a disservice to the the later wine. And if you were a vineyard whose wine is being tasted, do you have a preference? Uh, would you have a preference? If I was a vintner, I would hopefully want my wine tasted. I would want it tasted more the middle, so their palate's warmed up, and then they've had some, they've tasted some things. It's not completely wrecked, it just gets warmed well, up. They've, they've been tasting, they're in the right mindset, but the, their palate's not completely wrecked. Physiologically, what does it mean to warm up and wine tasting? What has to happen? Well, when they're when you're competing or someone's analyzing wine, you're analyzing. I mean, you have to you have to guess the acidity level of the wine. I mean, in each of these competitions, they'll give you a spectrum of of five choices, like from light to heavy, um, alcohol level. Um, and you have to accurately analyze all that. And I think if you're tasting just one wine or the first wine, for me oh, at least, I see. might yes. be a little, just a little uh, off. Yes, yes, not, yes. Yeah. Not, not full range. You have to guess the right fruits. I mean, is it citrus? Is it cream citrus? Is it lime? Is it grapefruit? You kind of have to narrow that all yeah. down. Oh. It is interesting. Yeah. Now, uh, this is what kind of a wine? This is Sauvignon Blanc. And we could have that with what kind of food? And it's then cheese? But first food. For me, Sauvignon Blanc is great uh, seafood wine. I mean, the classic pairing for Sauvignon Blanc is crab cakes. <laughs> I love crab cakes and Sauvignon Blanc. It'll bring out the, the sweetness of the crab. Of the crab? Um, yeah, great seafood wine. I enjoy it with salads, too, um, especially with a citrus dressing. The sky's the limit, really, with the with, with Sauvignon Blanc. It's a great aromatic wine. And what's the appeal of eating cheese? Um, it tastes good. It tastes good. The fat it's part. The fat. I mean, cheese is fat. <laughs> fat is flavor. Um, cheeses can also be pungent. So take a cheese like uh, goat cheese. Yes. Uh, chef, high in acid. Um, you need a wine that's also high in acid, which luckily Sauvignon Blanc, specifically classically Sancerre from the Loire Valley, which is Sauvignon Blanc is the perfect pairing with uh, goat cheese, which we have right in front of us. Oh, good, because I prefer goat cheese. Yeah. But can you taste the difference? Sometimes I imagine I can, and I say this is between sheep cheese and goat cheese. Yeah, I think there's a, there's subtle differences. And yes. again, it's going to, cheese is so variable from batch to batch because so many things can go wrong. I mean, it could not harden right, it could not age properly. It, it's there's a lot of variability in the cheese. So one batch of sheep's cheese could taste different than the next one. And then comparing that to goat cheese, it could always be different. Now, are certain cheeses uh, 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 prone to be uh, kept out, out, out of refrigeration and some require refrigeration? Some, yeah, from what, what, from what I've been told yes. I don't know the specifics though, so I, I won't even try and make it out. But um, for me, and from what I've heard, you don't want to, of course, wrap cheese in bags. So often we're putting cheeses in bags and putting them in the fridge. Cheese is alive, it needs to breathe. So that's why I'd recommend putting it in a cheesecloth or uh, wax paper. Yes, I've been told paper, but not, not plastic. Yeah, because you're basically suffocating the cheese. Your cheese will go bad faster. That way. Okay, so with this one, what cheeses do you have here? I have a Manchego, oh, I love hard that. cheese, and then also a, uh, a Chef goat cheese. 
Okay. I would recommend the Chev, the soft, the soft Chev with the soft jam bottom. I see. Because? Uh, Chev is high in acid. It's very sour. And Sauvignon Blanc is also high in acid and then sour, and they will they will bind together and match each other in acidity. Whereas you might not be able to do that with, say, a Chardonnay or a red wine like this Malbec I have hidden down here. Okay, so if we were sitting down and we had crackers, but we're going to yes. use our fingers here. Yes. Would uh, which would you chase first? Would you put the fat in your mouth and eat the cheese, or would you start with the wine? The way we we should eat and pair wine with food is it's wine, food, wine. Wine, food, wine? Wine, food, wine. So you sip a wine, bite a food, sip a wine. Oh, really? Well, here we go. Here's to that. No, but not spoiling. And why is that so? Why Why is that better? That, that you're, you're just able to coat your mouth better with the wine first, because it's kind of hard to have food in your mouth and then take some wine in with the food at the same time, it's very awkward, but we try our best. Mm. I see your point. Yeah, no, it, it enhances the flavor of the, of the goat cheese. It doesn't make it sticky or pungent or off-putting. It just kind of Listen. It lifts it up. Listen. And what is the other wine you have for us? The other wine we have is a Malbec. Okay, tell us about this. So, in the Argentina, kind of uh, brought Malbec back to life, South America did. It was, uh, it's originally a French grape yes. from Bordeaux. And it's all but disappeared. And then they discovered these grapevines found in South America. They thought it was something completely different, and then the DNA tested it. Is that important It used to have more importance now, or in France. Um, it's definitely important in, in Argentina. It's kind of what they're known for. I mean, it's, it's basically, Argentina's done the same thing for Malbec that New Zealand has done for Sauvignon Blanc. And what the Australian wines are known for which? Uh, Syrah, Shiraz. They're also making some really nice Chardonnays, Rieslings. Uh, together with my late husband, we went to the Margaret River area. Yes. That's quite a... It's beautiful. That's the thing is, grapes don't grow in ugly places either. <laughs> grapes, grapes like nice places. Oh, interesting. Harry, red wine. Red wine. Malbec. Okay, we started to talk about the Margaret River. Yep. And also uh, New Zealand. Mm -hmm. And this grape is known for what? And why is it so important in Argentina? So Malbec all but disappeared from France, from Bordeaux, where, where it started, and then they discovered it down in Argentina. Different style, it's very fruit forward, aromatic. Um, there's some nice, we call them dusty aromas, but they're like, the good kind of dusty aromas. Um, it's, yeah, it's basically like putting your hand in the soil and uh, eating it, but in a pleasant way. So this doesn't have a fruit? Well, it, it does have tons of fruit, of ripe red and black fruits, um, but it also has a, a tertiary, and, and, uh, an earthy aroma to it as well. Talk to us about terroir. Okay. Because it's a non, we don't have an equivalent uh, word in English. Yeah, there's no real definition for it, uh, or translation for it in English. Um, it really, and everyone has their own definition of terroir. And mine is, it is the culmination of the geography and culture of the region where the wine is made and the grapes are grown. So and the climate. And the, it's, yeah, it's, the, it's the, the climate, that's weather year in, year out. It's the geography, it's altitude, it's who grew the grapes, it's who pruned the grapes, it's the people who make the wine. It's even what they eat, their language, and it's, it's culture. That's what I heard. When you said culture, I'm thinking, I wonder if they started growing grapes to complement their food. I mean, well, let me see. The people who bought it tended to buy those kinds of their food. Increased following and popularity. I would say it's evolved that way, yeah. I mean, if you go to Piedmont in Italy, they eat risotto, the eat truffles, the eat hearty dishes. 
and they drink a lot of Nebbiolo, Barbaresco, and Brolo, which just naturally goes with those foods. Um, same goes what grows together, goes together, food and wine, meant to, meant to be. When we get back to Michigan, I'm going to go see what are wines that are popular and does it complement your food. Yes. Well, and that's the other hard part about America is we're not as regionally constrained as the rest of the world is. I mean, yes. you can have pizza, and then right next door there's Chinese. But yes. I would say there are there are at least regional differences on cuisine. Like down here in the Mississippi River, we've got Cajun Creole barbecue. That type Strong, of, yeah. spicy, very, salty, very um, yeah, very bold flavors. All right, let's let's have a taste of the wine. Really? Now I know enough to. Do I smell before I swish it around? Mm hmm. Okay. I, actually, this feels like stone fruit. It feels heavier. Heavier. A lot heavier. Yeah. I mean, it right. smells. You're also going to notice a little bit more alcohol in this wine, too. Red wines will have a little bit more alcohol than red wines. Parenthetically, explain that story on the food forget that you did when we were at the rum roof. Yeah, so uh, hard, out, hard liquor um, on equals of proof. And the saying goes that um, the British Royal Navy uh, sailors, once they conquered Jamaica and they were in the Caribbean, uh, the Pirates of the Caribbean and all that, uh, the sailors would get a, a rum ration. And it, the, 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 the story goes that they would dip their, their paper, their wadding paper for their muskets, in their rum ration. And if it fired, if, if it lit, that was proof that the rum hadn't been watered down. So interesting. And, 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 the history of words. Yeah, it, it, it's just, it's a fun kind of, yeah. A fun idea that that's, okay. we've we've come so far since then. Now I sniffed the, the lighter um, with the first sniff. How is that possible? Okay, now I'm doing what do you call the nasal swirl? You're, yep, you're swirling. And then you're gonna sniff again. Do you have any, what does it remind you of? <laughs> it reminded me of lightning going through my brain. <laughs> I haven't had that experience, yeah. but, but after I swallowed, it felt more acidic than the inhale. So you're getting Led me to believe, because remember I said it was fuller? Mm -hmm. So but I don't know if they add, that's the alcohol. Age, you say, doesn't really make that much difference. Because you said three years for white, that it's good, five years yeah. for red. Yeah, age, well, age can, can matter. I mean, you'll get different aromas and acids, and, and alcohols will, will fluctuate. But this is a relatively young red wine. 2016. It's a very, very new vintage. Okay, so we're going to try. I did it that way. No, no, she is. Yeah. Actually, there's a multiplier effect. Of, it, of enhancing? Yes, or? yes. I wouldn't have, because it's one of my favorite cheeses, I wouldn't have imagined that that might, might be. And I see, I now have experience with complementary flavoring that you were referring to. I experienced it more with this one than the other one. Yeah, it definitely enhances the herbaceousness of the cheese. I mean, because what, <laughs> cheese can be so hard to pair, because more often than not, what's going to happen is you're going to get bitterness. Yes. Wine more often than not will make cheese taste better. Or the cheese will make the wine taste better, if you know what it is. And so what you're going for is just enhancing the flavors without that terrible aftertaste. Are there anything new grapes coming along, or new traditions of growing wine, or...? Yeah, I'd say it's always changing in the industry, and, and that's going to change from community to community, too. Um, like, trend-wise, right now, natural wine. It's pretty popular. It's, it's basically hands-off winemaking, letting the, the wine make itself. 
making his little adjustments, adding his little to it. Um, and there's been... I've been told that the, the, I don't know, the federal regulation would say you have to add sulfites to wine for stability. Say a word or two about that. So, yes, every wine label in America, it's in America, it has to say... In America, but it, not necessarily true in Europe or Japan. Well, yeah, if it's here, it has to say contain sulfites. Right. And that was actually lobbyists uh, in the 80s who were proponents of prohibition. That was their way of trying to get people to drink less. All wines contain sulfites. Varying, it's a, it is a it is a natural, uh, basically, byproduct of fermentation. Okay. Sulfites do occur naturally in wine, and then winemakers will choose to add sulfites because it, it's it's the the compound they use is sulfur dioxide, and it is used as an antioxidant and antimicrobial in the winemaking process. But if you add too much, it can taint your wine. Is it up to the grower or the, or the, the winemaker? Wine, up to the wine the, the amount. The amount and they use. Or, mm -hmm. So if European wines, Argentinian wines, New Zealand wines, they they require additional or they don't require I would have to look at their... Right. Yeah, it's, it's pretty much up to the grower, though. Or, I'm sorry, up to the winemaker. Um, I will say there are more sulfites in a bag of preserved fruit or a salad bar than there are in a bottle of wine. A bottle of wine? Yeah, uh, there are way more sulfites uh, in preserved fruit because it's an antioxidant. So, that are added. Well, oh yeah, that they yeah that are added than a bottle of wine. So, so folks who I say are, um, I mean, if a lot of people think they're allergic to sulfites, um, but it. It's not the case. If, if you can eat preserved fruit, you should be okay with wine. Thank you, Harris. This has been wonderful. So we've learned a great deal. One is sometimes the door closes on what you want to do, in this case, be a dancer. And in an accident of almost geography, because he's a wine-making area, and it was handy, he started dropping in, volunteering, taking courses, and now it's become a passion and a career about which he knows a lot, as you have seen. So I offer you that as a way of living your own life, is don't worry if things don't work out. Find something else that amplifies your life that you can give yourself to in great measure. And as I close out every program, do something kind for someone you know today, tomorrow, and going forward. Be generous. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll see you the very next time. And thank you, Harry. I really have enjoyed that. You have taught me so much to joy. <laughs> to contact Junia, send her an email at juniadonesthespark at gmail.com. For more information, program schedules, and news about future guests, go to www.juniadonethespark.com. Thank you for joining us. See you next time on Junia Dones the Spark. Local productions on QTV are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you.